Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the latest edition of the Woke Bros. Of course, I'm your co-host, Big Waz, a.k.a. Wazzy Lambre, and I'm joined by a very special guest. Uh, she is burning up the airwaves on TYT, Rebel HQ. She's a, she's a goddamn TikTok star. <laughs> you know, uh, one of my only friends I could say that about, uh, Jessica Burbank. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's good to be an honorary woke bro. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You are a woke sis, I I indeed. <laughs> uh, Nando could not make it today. And I was like, damn, like, I wonder who I should have on um, as a guest host. And um, yeah, I might have just saw you going in on the internet. And I was like, this is a no brainer. I need to have <laughs> Jess up here. So thank you for coming on. Yeah, we always have so much fun when we host together. So I'm excited. Absolutely. Um, you recently did a trip to Kentucky. Um, I did. Can you talk a little bit about your trip? You don't got to tell us what you were doing, but, you know, how was it? <laughs> Kentucky's crazy, man. Um, mm. You really, when you go there, you get a sense of how much we're in a bubble here in L.A. The Lyft ride I had from the airport to my hotel, I had this driver and I'm, I'm telling them a little bit about why I'm there. We're talking politics because that's what I do. And that's what came up. And she's like, yeah, like, I didn't know that Biden wasn't the one who overturned Roe versus Wade. And I was like, wow. And really had the belief that gas prices are high because when Biden came into office, that correlated to prices going up. Just like really no sense of what's going on with politics, but just based off of when stuff is happening blaming the president which is wild that's that i think that's how people generally yeah. view it like people who aren't sickos about it like you and i or nando or like you know a <laughs> lot of the people that we know who are just overly invested in these outcomes and and and, and following it or in print and you know on okay. stuff like tyt and and other digital media uh most people are just like yeah it's just fucked up it's because the president fucked it <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And then going there, I was talking to people about politics, just like stopping them on the street, talking about the upcoming election. Uh, stay tuned for the video. It's going to be out with more perfect union. But it's crazy how these issues are made so black and white. Like if you're on this side, you believe this. If you're on this side, you believe this. But a two minute conversation with any regular person just reveals that the narratives we hear don't even suffice to address how people are thinking about the issues and like there's so much common ground and we're taught mm. to believe the country's really polarized it's not if you just talk mm. to people five to ten minutes you realize we agree on most stuff and the solutions being offered are really what divide us more like the elected officials and the people in media are causing the division intentionally yeah i think what ends up happening is like People tend to map on to whatever side that they disagree with the beliefs of the craziest among them, right? Um, you know, uh, I think when it comes to right wingers, a lot of times people on the left have a have a tendency to think like everybody on the right wing, everybody who votes for Trump must be some racist, toothless, hayseed from Arkansas or whatever, who would leave his house like in head to toe MAGA regalia and American flags and all of that. And that's just not the reality. Uh, most people are, most people who vote Republican are absolutely nothing like that. And it's not to say that all of them, you know, who aren't like that are people we could reach in um, to convert them to our side. But I think there's more people than folks would, would give it credit for. And I think work like what you're doing um, sort of proves that point. Yeah, it's crazy how like the reason this the Uber driver was voting Republican and like Donald Trump had nothing to do with even what I was talking about. It's just I see a lot of people on food stamps that aren't mm. working that could be working. Mm. And people who are on welfare are just people who are lazy. Mm. And I started talking about like, you know, Walmart doesn't pay people enough money and they give their employees trainings. Here's how you get on food stamps. People working 40 to 70 hours a week. So are we going to blame the corporation that's profiting a ton but not paying their employees enough to live? No, we're going to blame 
people for being lazy and food stamps are a problem and the economy is bad. So vote Republican. It's really not people, that deep for most people. People really still going with the welfare shit when we have like the most piss poor welfare state um, of any developed <laughs> industrialized nation is that shit is kind of mind blowing. Like, I wonder yeah. if I wonder how many people know what it takes to actually get welfare. Like to actually get money out of the government, whether it be WIC checks, whatever the case, like they make that shit so hard. So hard. So hard. And we're not even spending that much money on it. Look at how much we're yeah. spending on defense and on everything else compared mm -hmm. to what we're spending on welfare. Uh, yeah, we've just got. Yeah, we're, good. We're, we're getting. Um, I know whenever we get to going, we could get so far. Up the field, but <laughs> I know we're going to get too deep into this. I want the audience, the audience, if they're not familiar with what you do, like Jess has a, she has a great presence on social media. Absolutely go follow her. But if you follow Jess, you know, when she get passionate about something, um, forgive the pun, but she's like a dog with a bone. Okay. <laughs> she will not let this thing go. Um, <laughs> Recently, I've noticed, and anybody who's been, who if you live in LA, this is all anybody's talking about news-wise. I don't know if this is made national news, but, you know, the LA City Council president and a couple other council members, all Latinx, all Mexican, I believe, got on a phone call and they disparaged um, Oaxacans. They called some white, some white councilman's black kid, a little monkey. Um, they talked about like sort of trying to disenfranchise black voters um, in their redistricting efforts. This is like really like crazy fraught stuff. Can you give people a little bit more insight as to what's been going on um, with the Los Angeles City Council? So there are these recordings and. I think they were done within City Hall. Someone left a mic somewhere because these sound like conversations in back rooms over coffee, not official mm -hmm. meetings. Mm -hmm. And they caught Nuri Martinez, who is the president of the L.A. City Council, in a conversation with, uh, you know, Gil and Kevin and uh, who was the other guy? Ron, like these these members of the they call themselves the Latino caucus in the city council which I get it, like you're from that community, you want to represent that community. But the conversation was really about redistricting so that Latinos win. And as they put it, the blacks don't win. Uh, also saying things about, you know, the white members of Congress, really just talking about people in the LA City Council, with the sole delineation of you're in this racial group, we're in this racial group, and therefore we have beef talking about Mike Bonin's son, who he's, uh, adopted this kid he's not black his husband's not black and now he's having to deal with this whole thing i can't imagine how difficult it is to mm -hmm. to raise a black baby as a white couple uh in these times and then have your colleagues calling the child a monkey because at some point that kid's gonna grow up and see this news so not only that but they are talking about redistricting from this perspective of like how do we keep our political power, not even like, how do we represent our communities the best? <laughs> it's like, like su such a long conversation about, well, let's get the Rams stadium in this district and you get the airport in your district so that we have assets, so that we have money, so that we keep winning elections. Uh, and really trying to dilute black votes in Los Angeles so that Latinos have more votes, right? This zero sum game when it should really be about how do we represent our communities the best? How do we give people good policy in Los Angeles? Uh, the the redistricting thing is really the main uh, you know subject of the conversation. But of course, they're saying these terribly racist things, saying we don't like the AG because he's with the blacks. Uh, this kid is a monkey. And so the real reason she's uh, now resigned after Biden called for his resignation, even mm. or her resignation, even Dianne Feinstein called for wow. like that's Diane Feinstein if she can remember to do that that is a big ass deal yeah Feinstein <laughs> of all of all people and it's crazy because like 
they're talking about redistricting and gerrymandering the hell out of those districts. That's the main thing they're focused on is keeping political power. That's the, the pulp of the recording. And she talks about Jose, who is a member of the city council, who took a $500,000 bribe from developers. And she's like, you know, I hope he gets exonerated. We shouldn't push for his resignation. We should push for suspension so he can keep getting a paycheck. And that's exactly what Nuri Martinez tried to do herself. She was like, I'm going to take a leave of absence, have conversations with my family. I'm really sorry. And we're like, no, that's not enough. Like, you can't represent the people of L.A. And it's just this deep rooted uh, history in L.A.'s founding when it was settled, uh, displacing indigenous communities people of color there, Black people, there's a lot of anti-Black racism and the Latino communities divided. People from those communities who wanted power had to exploit members of their community and other people of color. So it's this divide and conquer mentality that's been around since the founding of LA, which is not unique to LA, but everything's on full display now. And there has been, I've been at City Hall, I was at City Hall last night, finally, Nuri Martinez stepped down today. Wait, so she quit her job. She just she didn't just step down as city council president. Like she's done. She's no longer a councilwoman. Right. So at first, wow. It was, uh, <laughs> hey, everybody, like I'm gonna step down as president and take a leave of absence. And we were like, absolutely not. They disturbed city council again today, did a direct action, took the mic, LA tenants were there, the BLM movement was there, screaming, you know shut it down unless she resigns. If she doesn't resign, shut it down. And about an hour ago, I got the notification that she finally resigned. You know what was so interesting to me about the conversation and how base it was when it comes to, well, he's with the blacks and this and that. And then we, we represent the Mexicans or the Latinos or whatever. Um, my thing upon hearing that is, which Latinos do you represent? Mm -hmm. Which blacks does X, Y, and Z represent? Um, I, I, I just, I really wish people would, and I think that's part of the mission of this show of me and Nando, for people to understand the delineations, right? There's black rich people. There's black mega rich people. There's black working class people. There's black middle class people. Which group of those black people are you speaking to? Which Mexican people are you speaking to? Because you can't, because I don't believe you can represent the interests of all of them at once. Like, it's just antithetical to um, our material realities, right? And so I always find it fascinating when these people can't claim to be the sort of racial, as my man Pascal Robert would say, racial ventriloquist, right? Like, I represent all of you guys. Don't worry. It's me. I'll be that person representing every single Mexican in Los Angeles, which we know is impossible. Right. Absolutely. And Mike Bonin, the person that ended up being at the center of this, he is one of three city council members that voted against the criminalization of homelessness this past July. So there was this law that they came up with, uh, you know, section, I don't even remember, 11.46, doesn't matter, but it's, you can't have your tents on the streets within a certain distance from a school or a business or a parking lot. And it's like, LA is all buildings. Like, where are they going to go? You're going to have everybody live in tents in the park. Uh, I've seen those signs happen. in my neighborhood recently. Yeah, it's crazy. And so Mike Bonin, who is a white guy, was in there fighting like hell so that this wouldn't pass. And they made jokes about it. Like, oh, Mike's always fighting for the homeless, but what does he actually do for the homeless? He was trying to make sure you didn't make it illegal for them to live and exist, actually, if we want to think about it. And so the way they make it about race, when really the main problem here is class, because you have Ron Herrera, who also stepped down, who is uh, the head of the Labor Federation. He was caught on a mic talking about oh, we've got to get the unions together, we've got to get labor mobilized, and translate that to political power. So it's clear <laughs> his interest is not fighting for workers' rights, better working conditions, and higher wages for working people. He cares about worker power lining his pockets, keeping his reputation, which, I mean, it, all of the quiet parts were said out loud in this tape. And so a lot of stuff's going to change, because in the city council meeting, they weren't just talking about, please step down because of what you said. You had the L.A. Tenants Union in there saying, like, you're not fighting for us. You're not fighting homelessness. Like, they were using this moment where now there's national press focusing on L.A. after Biden called for their resignation 
now they're using the moment to to get other things done and put more pressure on the city council where you've got 15 people representing 4 million and doing a really bad job of it. Man, um, I, I know this is going to sound really hypocritical as a as a you know self-styled political pundit. I don't pay attention much to L.A. local um, city politics. Right. Um, mainly because like when you live in L.A., the only thing that you really care about is homelessness. It's like it see it feels like the only problem here. Um, when, when you get past, obviously you have a good job, you can pay your rent and whatever, like your kid, you can get childcare for your kids and all of that stuff. Like, it's like the one issue that every single person in this city seems to be affected by. Um, it's, you know, I, I don't know what the, I don't pretend to know what the answers are. Right. Because I don't really think like we could just round these cats up and put them in, you know, new housing, and that would solve it. I think a lot of these folks are, like, used to being on the street. Like, they're, they're, they've are sort of become street people. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know what you would do for somebody who's not interested in that. Of course, there are plenty of people who would like to have a roof under their head, you know, be able to take a shower consistently. But it's, like, so many people here who are homeless um, and dealing with, problems of mental health um they're dealing with uh drug addiction and again they've become accustomed to living on the streets like it's tough man it, it, it feels overwhelming at times honestly yeah it really does there's like two groups of people in la for like why they care about homelessness one group inconvenienced by these people being in the street and talking to them, right? They're like, I don't want to look at this. I don't want to be bothered by these people. Then there's another group of people who actually care about like human beings living like this and their circumstances. And everyone cares about it because everyone fits into one of those two categories, right? But you have this problem of developers buying off city council members, just giving them $500,000 in payments over a period of time to do what? to not regulate housing in Los Angeles because you have these developers come in, build luxury apartments, claim a loss when they can't fill the building because not everyone can pay $5,000 a month in rent. And then they're getting tax breaks and people are priced out of living in LA. Mm. Uh, it creates the problem of homelessness. And so what do we do? You've got to force some of the empty units in the city to have lower rent prices. That's like number one. Because when you're charging that much more in rent per year, especially in non-rent controlled units where it's perfectly legal to do a 100% rent increase, guess what? Now you've got to find a new apartment. You can't renew your lease because you can't afford it. And it's forcing people to end up on the streets. There's also the problem of like the short-term rentals, uh, totally inflating rent prices in Los Angeles. So if you can have a unit rent it out with a monthly rate on Airbnb for like four or $5,000. Mm. But if you have a long-term lease, you're only getting like 2000. What are you going to do? You're going to rent mm -hmm. it out with Airbnb because it's a much better price for you as a landlord. And so that needs to be regulated as well. And what do you do? I don't know. In Atlanta, they're saying, if you have an Airbnb, it needs to be your only Airbnb and you need to live there. Like that's your, your only unit that you have. And that's a pretty good, regulatory policy because now mm -hmm. you can't be an airbnb mogul with like 10 of these units and just profiting off of people visiting la because they work in the entertainment industry or whatever but it's also a mental health thing like my uncle uh grew up here he ended up he has mental health stuff he ends up in prison he gets released early don't know why uh nobody called us nobody told us he was not given resources he's just out the doors so he's not doing well. He starts living on the streets. We didn't even know he was out. He gets hit by a car and dies. The police wow. don't investigate when homeless Jesus. people are killed in Southern California. And so we find out three days later when they finally figure out who he was. And it took me so long to go back and read the news articles. And it's just like, homeless man was killed. No investigation of the driver, their mental state. Was it a DUI? And so we've also got to change how we think about homeless people, right? These are people who, you know, maybe need temporary residence, but need mental health care as well. And to be treated as human beings, not like, oh, well, it was just a homeless guy who died. We've got to change how we think about people. I want, I want to stay on that because yeah. 
and I want to play devil's advocate here. Uh, Cause honestly, like to be honest as a dude, I'm not scared of homeless dudes. Nine out of 10 homeless dudes, 10 out of 10, I'll fuck them up. Like I, I really, I don't like, I don't feel threatened by them. I'm not like, I don't really care. I don't have kids. So like when, when a dude is shooting up heroin, literally in broad daylight on the side of CVS, like I'm like, damn, this is appalling, but I don't really, I don't really care. To, to be honest, like I, I, I just don't. It's, I'm not as affected by it as other people. But if you are a, a smaller person, a woman, um, some of these cats get violent. You know, uh, some of these guys have real deep rooted issues, and like they are like a threat to the peace. Um, in certain communities, that's not all of them. It's not the majority of them. Most people don't bother people. They just, you know, do their drugs, mind their business, and and they're chilling. I'm just saying, like, there are these issues, and and it's easy for those things to stick in people's minds. Like, I'm sure you got, you know, you got sent the link with the the, the homeless guy who was literally throwing his shit at at um the restaurant tour dude, like literally shitting on the sidewalk. You feel me, like. It's not fair to categorize all homeless people as that, but like there's a material reality that a lot of these people are literally making people's lives worse um, because of all of the things we mentioned, drug use, mental health issues, all of that. Um, what do we what do we do about that? Because I'm telling you, man, that's the type of shit that's sent to um turn suburbanites into reactionaries like this. That right there, that easily. These people, because you know, let's keep it real. Like these people have good jobs, ain't worried about health care, ain't worried about child care, ain't worried about like the sort of material things that you and I think are the most important things in politics. But that shit, homeless people shooting up on the sidewalk. Man, in fucking Park Slope, me and Anna talked about this yesterday. The dude beat some chick's dog to death. <laughs> he attacked the chick, then beat the chick's dog to death. Like people remember that. And when we're because like if the if the idea being that we gotta build some sort of coalition movement stuff, I don't think the message it can be like, well, let's treat the homeless like human beings. You know what I mean? Right. Of course not. Of course not. It's gotta be a conversation where you have people recognize like their own humanity and don't think from a place of fear because like I deal with it too like last night going to city hall to the protest I'm walking through there's a park right by city hall I park a block away I'm walking through the park at night it's dark there's not lights and I just hear a voice hey baby come here and I'm like oh no <laughs> and I look over and yeah it's a guy who's homeless who's just like in the park for the night and I just look at him and I'm just like, have a good night. Like, I just keep walking. Nothing happened. Something could have happened, right? Like, this is not a safe situation for everyone. And so when people are like, we can't do handouts. We can't just give these people a home and a place to stay. Like, people have to work. Okay. Are I disagree with that. To... But yeah, I, I, I think we can yeah. do handouts. We do it all the time um, for course. rich people. But whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but if we face that argument, which is a common one. Mm hmm how much money are we going to spend uh, on putting that person in prison if we leave them in the streets and they do end up committing a crime? Like from a resource perspective, if you're worried about tax dollars and how we handle this issue and will it be expensive to house these people, it is far more cost efficient to give them a temporary house before they commit a crime ever and help them get a job and employ people as well-paid public employees to help these people get jobs and get themselves on their feet and get mental health care and have a place to live so that they're not in the streets about to commit a crime. And, you know, how we reach people on this, I think it's just common sense. Like, do you want people to be on the street or would you rather spend perhaps a less amount of public dollars to temporary house them and temporarily house them and get them off the streets? Like, I feel like that's a no brainer, but a lot of people don't really think about public policy from the perspective of what's the cost benefit analysis of putting these criminals in jail because they think they need to be punished. They've wronged someone, but we can prevent it before we get to that point. Yeah. I, I, look, I'm, I'm fully on board with that. I think 
I think the housing crisis in this country is not, um, I don't think it's fully appreciated. And I don't think the powers that be have a, if they have a firm grasp on it, they don't seem to be acting um, in a way that would suggest that they did, right? Because I think we need to be building way more housing right now all over the place, period. Um, and I know there's all of these, oh, my property value is going to go down and all of those people. And I, and I get that, but the, like what the situation we have right now is untenable places like San Francisco. I mean, New York, there's really nowhere else to build. <laughs> Motherfuckers just got to move out of New York at this point. <laughs> there's nowhere else to build, but like places like San Francisco, like LA could be more vertical. Like there could be more you know, uh, apartment buildings and, and therefore more units, therefore making it, you know, more housing available, which will bring down some of these rents. I think we need to address that. But like, again, and I think it's legitimate that somebody living in Sherman Oaks where that dude is throwing his shit at people. Um, they should have a reasonable expectation that human shit won't get thrown at them when they're going to Ralph's. You feel me? Yeah, totally. That's, that's a reasonable thing to want in your society. Like we're asking for the bare minimum. Um, yeah, the crazy thing is there are six million empty units in the United States right now, and around wow. five hundred fifty thousand homeless people. This is a problem wow. with a clear solution, and we're taught to believe that like there's not enough to go around. There absolutely is. Nice. The problem is that. Have you been to the middle of the country? We could build so much more shit in this country. Are you shitting me? There's a lot of room plenty of space. There's a lot of space. Yeah. So, like, we have everything we need to give everybody what they want. What we have is an allocation issue, and you can figure out why we have that if you just follow the money. These developers are buying out politicians so that they don't regulate the housing industry. All of the landlords just want to make money and they want to keep rent high, and they would rather have vacant units than lower their rent. Because, guess what? If you can make the same amount of profit with less tenants to worry about, that's oh, what they're going to do because all they idea. care about is money. And so we don't have regulation because the politicians would also rather line their pockets with bribes, just taking the cash directly like people in the L.A. City Council do and getting campaign donations and donations to their super PAC and being invited to go speak at some event and collecting a bag from that. And so how do we fix this? We've got to have good people fighting. Uh, and I don't think the answer is just let's let's vote let's like get some more good people in office and vote them in it's got to be <laughs> stuff like what we did at the la city council which is to just show up make them really uncomfortable scream and shout because power is going to concede nothing without a demand like it's got to be people in the streets people disturbing meetings people making rich people uncomfortable it's really the only way we're going to get change that and what you and i have talked about a lot which is striking withholding your labor <laughs> as a worker uh, and the general strike 2024 y'all General strike 2024, y'all. Uh, <laughs> and the shit throwing thing also, like when we talk about crime with people, it's a huge problem in our politics that people fight people and are mad at people and not mad at systems. So mm. like with crime, why are certain communities over police? Let's start there. Why are certain behaviors criminalized? People smoking weed has been a reason for the police to go and disturb them and then find a different reason to arrest them for so long, especially black communities. Like we know this, we know that the police came to be uh, as former slave patrols. Like if you follow their roots through history, that's the founding of the police in America. Then we think about like why people are in a position where they need to do things like steal because they don't have enough. You'll see the, the NYPD posting up pictures. Like we got a bunch of stuff back from someone who's a thief and it's bottles of baby formula. Like these people are trying to feed their damn kids. Why don't they have economic opportunity? Because intentionally people have removed economic opportunities from the black and brown communities. They're committing crimes, which are really just them trying to survive. And then even the people who are violent, you can trace back even serial killers. The reason most people become serial killers they've found is like severe trauma in childhood. What leads parents to be like that? Well, in our country, we tend to send people away to fight very brutal wars on behalf of U.S.-based multinational corporations because they have some economic interest in another country abroad. They come back super mentally messed up, and then they're going to raise kids. How are those kids going to turn out, right? And so you can trace back a lot of crime and criminalized behavior to the state. And then what is our solution? 
to lock them up, put them in cages, and oftentimes make them do labor for very low wages. And that's why the 13th Amendment was very deliberate in saying slavery is illegal except as punishment for a crime in the United States. And so we've got to be mad at those systems and not mad at the people who oftentimes are a product of circumstance. Yeah, I, I, I'm fully with you on that. I think we need to be producing citizens who don't beat the shit out of women and dogs in, in broad daylight in Park Slope, uh, nice liberal haven, Park Slope, Brooklyn. However, in the meantime, there's dudes committing crimes, right? Like, and there are people having crimes committed against them, you know? And, and so until we get to a point where, uh, we are um, producing better outcomes for our people where, you know, we're getting the homelessness rates down We're we're keeping kids in schools and, 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 and getting them good jobs when they become adults and, you know, not housing uh, uh, scarcity or food scarcity and all of this type of stuff. Until we do that, um, I think what most people would say is that, like, we got to we got to deal with the situation as it is, right? Um I I I I'm definitely somebody who thinks like, yeah, uh you catch somebody with some crack, some heroin, some some coke, some weed like getting high. I I don't see why we need to arrest them and, and put them in prison and all of that, but like yeah, you whoop somebody's ass, you kill somebody. Yeah, I think I think you need to be. I think it's safe to say you need to sit down for a while. We need you, 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 you abuse the privileges that we gave you in society, and we need to you you need to take a break from society. Uh, I, I'm I'm definitely firmly in belief of that. <laughs> yeah, I think most people are on board, and it's just like, how do we get to the point where we can do the thing, right? Like, what are exactly? The steps? Exactly, um, you're right. And it's like, yeah, most people who are like, well, it's never going to work. How are you going to make it happen? It's the same kind of like arguments that you hear for Medicare for all, right? Like, mm. how are you going to pay for it? It's this, it's that. Like, I agree we need universal health care, but how are you going to get it done? It's like, do you really agree with us if that's your hang up? Like, maybe not. Mm. Because if you agreed, you'd be like, let's work together and figure out how we get there. And with you, like, I know you want it to happen. How do we make it get there? How do we get to the point where it can happen? And it's like, we give people more resources. We've got to increase access to public goods. We can't have corporations profiting off of people's labor while they're making nothing and can hardly afford to live. Like we've got to tax corporate profits tremendously and reinvest in our communities. It used to be a situation where it's like, we all pay in some money and now we have public schools because no one themselves can build a school to teach their kids. Like we've got to employ teachers. The kids need a place to go. They've got to be with other kids. Like people understand public goods when you describe them, but public goods is one of those overused words that's not often defined. But we all pay into this system, this society by working. But when corporations are able to pay people $7.25 an hour and make billions every year, it's no wonder our communities are destroyed. All of the money and wealth is going to the people who own mm. corporations and our shareholders in them. And so we've got to tax corporations. That's a great place to start and redistribute that wealth by providing good public health, uh, universal health care, including mental health care and dental care, making sure people all have access to really good schools, not just the wealthy communities having the best schools in a school district, but making sure the tax dollars are distributed among people. So places like Boston, where you've got the Roxbury neighborhood, that's pretty poor, mostly black. And then you have this carved out part that should be a part of Boston Brookline, where all of the rich people who live and work in Boston live, they have the best schools because they pay the most in taxes because they have the highest income. Like we've got to correct how the money flows and how public goods are provided. Because if people have health care, they have enough food to eat, their children are taken care of. Those are not the type of people that are going to end up in a situation of despair where they want to numb their pain and use heroin and their mental health is so bad that they want to hurt other people for no reason at all, people who haven't wronged them. And so it's got to start with redistributing resources. How do we get people to agree to that? The only way is withholding our labor. Like we've got to make really big demands to correct the corrupt systems in our society through just cutting off their line to getting more wealth, which is people doing work. Like that's how they make money. Nothing moves without the workers. 
I love that. Um, I wanted to get you up here to talk about the Senate, but I don't give a shit about that um, anymore. <laughs> I, I do want to just so again, I want the people um, who are listening to get a better understanding of you and your story. And I do think you have a really interesting story. I don't just say that because you're from the Northeast like me. And I think that we're the most interesting people in the world. But no, I think you do have a cool, fascinating story. Like I said, you know, um, you're doing a lot of great work with TYT. You're pretty popular on TikTok. Um, you know, you worked on the Bernie campaign. Um, you've done so many cool things. Can you give people a little sense of your background and, and how you got to be where you are these days? Yeah. So I grew up, like Waz said, in the tri-state, which is the best place in the entire world. Uh, <laughs> it's also where the best people in the entire world come from. Uh, I love the tri-state. Growing up there, I was like, I got to get out. But now I'm like, oh, it's the best. So I grew up like 45 minutes out of New York. Uh, my dad was driving trucks in and out of the city. Then he started being a carpenter, super working class family. My mom was a bookkeeper. Neither of them have college degrees. So when the financial crisis hit, like we are one of those families where like the bottom fell out. And uh, I remember my mom like saying to me as she's driving me and my sister somewhere, we're in the back, she's in the front. And she's like, listen, like, I don't know how possible it is for college to happen. Like, I don't think we can send you guys to college. So like, we need to think about what, what y'all are going to do. And so I went to trade school, which was the best. And I learned so much and I hated school it was like a C student. Didn't like my regular what, what trade. Did, what trade did you take up? Agriculture. <laughs> oh my God. So are you, do, are, do you have like a green thumb now? Yeah. I'm, wow. I'm, not, I'm not like a house plant person. Oh, I, okay. I so not the it. house plant, but we could put you on a plantation and you would get to work. I would get to work. <laughs> if, I, if I had to. If, if it's what I had to do. When the revolution comes, you've got to grow your own food. All right. Wonderful. That's good to know. Yeah. So I was doing that. And then um, I was just skipping class and spending all my time in the trade school building because it was so much more fun than regular class and uh, started doing like, uh, these career development events, they started pushing me into doing stuff with the trade school. And I ended up learning a lot about corporate agriculture. And I was like, getting a sense of why things are the way they are in the world. And uh, because I was doing those events and public speaking, I like rose to leadership within the trade school. And my guidance counselor uh, was always having me in her office. Like, why are you never in gym class? Like you're failing gym class. Like, why do you never do this? And so she knew I was a bit of a case. And one day my English teacher was like, I got a C on a paper. And my friend goes, Oh my God, Jess, you got a C in front of the whole class. And the teacher is just like, you know what? People who get C's end up running the world and getting stuff done. But that's nothing like what I was told. I was told like the people who do well, get good grades. So I ended up getting scholarships to go to college. And my mentor was this guy, Patrice Lumumba Kasongo. And whoa. Yeah. So his <laughs> uncle is Patrice Lumumba, wow. who's the guy who freed the slaves in the Congo. Uh, of course. and ended up getting killed by the CIA. Of and so course. learning about the world from him, he just like took me under his wing as soon as I got there. And uh, I had to leave because we couldn't afford it after the Pell Grants ran out. And he sent me an email and he was like, you need to come back. I'm going to make you my teaching assistant so you can be on work study and you can afford to come back. Like wow. work now, but we're going to figure this out so you can come back. So he's like the only reason I ended up graduating and like learning what about how the this? systems are the way they are. This was Wells College, which is this okay. like tiny school in upstate New York. They like my guidance counselor got me a scholarship there because they have this Wonderful. like leadership scholarship program for kids who are like doing stuff, but not good at class. And so after that, I was just organizing and bartending, like fighting systems and stuff. And uh, I felt like I didn't have enough impact. So I went to graduate school, which is like a silly thing to do. Uh, there's like, <laughs> like, you don't have to go to graduate Cone head, school. pointy headed dork. Yeah. Who does always, that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought that like systems are the way that they are because some really smart person worked out the math and it turns out like yeah. it's just not going to work. In grad school, I found out none of those people have the answers. Yeah. And I was like, burn it all. <laughs> um, like growing up working class and like seeing my family struggle and then getting to Brown University and these guys who wear suits every day, whose parents went to Harvard, 
don't have the answers for why things are the way they are. And they're good with it. They're like, oh, we just like write these policy studies. They're not interested in resolving the problems mm. of the world or fixing suffering. In fact, they don't even know what questions to be asking. They don't know mm. what life is like for everyday America. And so after grad school, I was like, F this. I'm going to go work for the Sanders campaign because this is like the wow. only movement for real change. And then from there, I went back to organizing and then started making TikToks when the pandemic hit. Because I think like there's no reason people don't know this stuff. And intentionally, they're kept ignorant of it. So I was like, well, I can just post on TikTok and maybe some people will watch it. And people are hungry for this information. Like they like knowing how systems have been set up to defeat them. And they're kind of playing themselves, these big companies that mm. let us just post whatever. And they've started yeah, it and censoring sh us. Don't let yeah. the Chinese government hear this. Um, that is so freaking cool, man. Um, That's the whole thing was. That you sort of identified something that you had a passion for, which is organizing, getting people together, and trying to make their lives, even if it's just a little bit better. Uh, that is just incredible. Um, obviously, you know, I'm a big fan of the work that you're doing. Always dope when we connect over there on the TYT side. So I just so happy you came on the Woke Bros today. Please tell the audience where they could find you and your work and your uh, just amazing online presence. Well, this is just hyping me up today. Um, <laughs> you can find me on TikTok, TYT, More Perfect Union. Those are the places. I love it. Um, yeah, so go check that out. Shouts to my man, John Gervais, for uh, producing the show today. Nando will be back next week. Um, make sure you become a Patreon at patreon.com backslash count the dings. Uh, it's, a, it's a cup of Starbucks a month to support some of the great work that we're doing here um, over here at Count the Dings. Um, we'll see you next week. Peace.